So uh, Adil, as a way to, to begin the conversation, uh, give us a bit of a, an overview of the water situation around the world today. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John Marcus. Again, a pleasure to join this interesting conversation. And as you say, uh, water is a significant component as a, as a global issue, and uh, it, it sort of uh, wraps around uh, many of the other discussions that uh, we might be having on, on justice around, uh, for example, food or energy or economic stability, environmental migrants, uh, you know, so there's a lot of other underlying issues. But let me start off by uh, giving you a sense of perspective on what the global challenges are uh, that, that we're trying to address. Um, if we look at the human side of the question first, uh, there is about close to a billion uh, people who are without access to uh, safe drinking water. And there's a somewhat larger number of people who do have access, but they might need to walk uh, to get to it. So it's, n it's not equivalent of uh, having a tap at your home. So there's a very large number. The number is actually larger for people who are without access to adequate sanitation. And that number at the present stands as, uh, at 2.6 billion. So it's about a third of the humanity at the moment is without access to sanitation. And in fact, in this uh, second statistic, uh, we see a trend going in the wrong way. So the last time we looked, uh, two years prior to this uh, recent number, uh, that was 2.5 billion. So now it's gone up to 2.6 billion. So we're not able to address the uh, the population increase uh, simply. So we're, we're falling behind. The human consequences are very significant. The estimate that WHO puts out is that there are about three and a half million people who die each year. About half of them are children under the age of five from water-related diseases. You know. Uh, more epidemics like cholera, but more commonly things like diarrhea uh, kill infants and children. And, and this is a truly preventable uh, problem, and it's a shame that we have to look at this statistic. Now let's look at the other side of the equation. Uh, we know that uh, you know about 40% of the uh, global population now lives in water-scarce environments, and these are uh, countries or regions where available water is below the threshold uh, which the which has been established as the minimum required for people to survive. This has also, uh, as I hinted at earlier, direct consequences for food production because agriculture in many parts of the world is dependent on uh, adequate availability of water. And uh, therefore, when we look at uh, trends for uh, climate change, for example, where we are already seeing unprecedented floods and droughts, uh, we know that many of these water scarce and dry areas are projected to become drier. So we're running into some rather severe situations uh, when we look down the road. So those are the two dimensions of the problem. One is a very human one, uh, and the cost is also a very human one. The other one is also related to how societies operate and, and react, uh, but that relates to how we manage as a policy and a, at an institutional level the issues of uh, water consumption and, and protection of water resources. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you, you began by giving us these uh, this numbers. One billion uh, uh, has no access to uh, safe drinking water and 2.6 billion without uh, adequate uh, sanitation. So these people who are really in, the, in a dire situation, uh, where are they? I mean, it's uh, mainly in developing countries, but in, in, geographic, in geographical terms on, on the map, you know, where are they? Sure. I can point to maybe four or five major regions which are water scarce. Uh, most of uh, uh, North Africa and Middle East region uh, or is, is an area which is traditionally has been water scarce, and this is an area which is project, projected to get even drier over time. Similarly, Central Asia, the former Soviet republics, uh, they're all in a water scarce uh, environment, and the situation has actually worsened a little bit because uh, in the traditional arrangements in the in the Soviet Union era, there was a lot of interflow of resources and uh, areas which were water scarce were able to survive uh, because there were 
flow of uh, goods and services coming in from elsewhere. So that system has now been broken over the last uh, 20 years as the region has evolved. So that's also under severe uh, constraints. The other two are the uh, Indian subcontinent and the uh, parts of uh, Western China, uh, which are also uh, very severely water scarce and, and are projected to get uh, get worse. I might, might add a fifth area, which is uh, Southern Africa, which is uh, uh, getting more water scarce also. Now, this is, as, as you pointed out, this is where majority of the population is, about 95, 96% of the people who live in dry areas are in these regions. But there are also dry areas, for example, in North America. Uh, mm -hmm. Significant parts of uh, US and Canada and parts of Mexico are also uh, very water scarce. And uh, those challenges actually are also now coming to the surface. So it's not that it's just a developing country problem, but there are also mm -hmm. countries uh, in the developed world which are facing the same problems. They might have different resources to address these challenges. Uh, but nonetheless, the underlying problem is still the same. And, and so these, uh, these regions which you described as water scarce are also the ones in which or where you know you have these 1 billion people uh, with no access to drinking water and 2.6 billion uh, who have uh, no adequate sanitation, right? Yes, and, and actually it's a confluence of crises. So when we talk about what we call the bottom billion, Mm -hmm. uh, the same billion I've talked about uh, without access to water, mm -hmm. in, in, mostly in Africa and Asia. These are also the people who are without access to energy. These are the people who uh, have very high infant mortality rates, uh, sometimes 100 times or 150 times higher than what we typically see in the developed world. And these are also the people where the economic conditions are, uh, on average, much poorer uh, mm -hmm. compared to, again, you, you see one or two orders of magnitude of difference uh, in income levels. And again, I give you the example of China, where when you look at the eastern China, where water sources are relatively more available ver versus western China, uh, there's, again, a factor of 10 difference uh, in the average income level of people. So the consequences, even within countries of uh, this uh, water crisis, are quite significant. So, in fact, you are telling us, Adil, that uh, these regions which are encountering or which are suffering from a water crisis are not really uh, being exposed to this single crisis. They are also in the midst of a multiplicity of crises. Absolutely. And actually, we see that uh, the overall development agenda of the kind that came out from the, uh, from the original Millennium Summit and has been renewed a number of times since then, uh, that actually is threatened by not addressing water issues adequately. And when we look at, for example, the Millennium Development Goals, we see that each and every one of them has to be uh, connected and correlated to availability of water in order to be successful. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, when we talk about uh, women's education, you know, that's, that's a goal inside Millennium Development Goals. What we see in many of these developing countries that young girls uh, have to leave school when, the, when they hit the age of puberty. And they simply need to do that because there are no more adequate toilet facilities in which they can attend the schools in privacy. So it's a very simple uh, driver, but the consequences are quite profound. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when we talk about poverty reduction and uh, reducing the number of people without poverty, and those billions certainly qualify as, as people living way below the, the poverty line. Uh, we think that you can actually create a lot, lot of economic opportunities for those people by actually uh, allowing them to invest in, in water-related uh, uh, businesses and creating new green jobs. So there's also the positive aspect uh, of, of this whole mm -hmm. situation. So this water crisis and, and, and this water, this crisis in general, are not simply a matter of geography. It's also, uh, and I guess it goes without saying, it's also a matter of, uh, it's, it's a development crisis, right? Yes, and, uh, you know, in some ways, um, we as the international community have not dealt with it quite in the right way. And Why? I can add to that the the national governments in most cases have not addressed it adequately either. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you see that 
in uh, how investments are made internally, how economic uh, uh, development is focused in particular regions. And we find that even within countries, uh, areas where there is water scarcity, and some of them have significant uh, human populations, are bypassed and looked over for uh, development investments. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there is a there is an underlying problem, uh, which, as you suggest, c relates it directly back to economic development, mm -hmm. and that is not being addressed, uh, we believe, appropriately at the moment. But isn't it paradoxical, Adil? Because on the one hand, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a specialist of these issues, but one would think that uh, you know water issues are not truly on the map. I mean, we talk about uh, these issues a lot. So, and, and yet you are telling us that uh, they are not being addressed properly. So. You know, how do we address them? I mean, in media circles, in in policy circles, and and first of all, and and what are the problems with the way we address them? Yes. Well, let me start with uh, maybe giving a description of uh, where uh, my understanding is that mm -hmm. that we are in terms of uh, uh, this apparent gap between a need and a requirement to act and invest in water and the actual action at the policy level, both by national governments and the wider uh, international community. Um, the, the gap partly is that of perception. And I think uh, many people in the policymaking circles uh, do not understand the, the fundamentals of, uh, of, of uh, water management and, and water uh, utilization. And there is a tendency to say, you know, let's build, uh, uh, you know, new infrastructure, new facilities without really uh, thinking through how those will be uh, impacting uh, uh, water resources. The most recent example we see of this uh, disconnect is uh, the large global debate on biofuels. And there's a lot of interest and investment going into biofuels. Uh, but the underlying issue that to produce one kilowatt hour of uh, power from uh, 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 you know, from corn or soya uh, takes about 10,000, maybe uh, 20,000 times more water per unit of energy to, to produce. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are these disconnects that exist in policy. Now, what has happened in the last few years, um, I would say last five to ten years, uh, there has been increasing public attention on water issues. And what is driving that? There, there are two things which are which are driving it. One is that there have been uh, quite a few disasters uh, and uh, uh, catastrophes where water has been involved. And that has uh, raised the consciousness uh, that water is a critical uh, need. And, and if you're not being mindful of managing it properly, it can have uh, very severe consequences. Again, I give the example of the floods in Pakistan. Uh, where the estimate is that there was about six to seven percent of the GDP was impacted last year uh, because of these uh, this major uh, flood. So the cost in human life was not as large as it has been historically. So there were about 2,000 people who lost their lives, uh, but it affected about a third of the country, and and again very significant conse uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. So there are these uh, crises which are which are. Uh, raising the public consciousness. And uh, on the other side, there's also uh, a realization that economic development is uh, being uh, somehow uh, impaired as a result of uh, not having adequate water resources. Um, this comes through most uh, notably in the, in the form of impacts on food pricing. And the food crisis that we saw in uh, the, well, the pricing crisis we saw in 2009 and uh, there are, again, predictions that we will see a repeat of very high food prices. Uh, so, again, we see some of those trends are happening as of today. So, so the economic realization, uh, I think, is, again, raising the consciousness. So that's, that's what's happening at the moment. And there is, a, as you uh, correctly identified, there is a big push coming from behind to say we need to uh, take a step back and take note of, of uh, what it means. The kind of policy response which is needed is still not there. Uh, and I give you the example of the climate change debate, uh, where we think 
water should figure very centrally uh, because at the end of the day, climate change really is about what happens to water. It's not about whether we heat up on average by two degrees or four degrees, but actually what happens to water cycle, when water appears, where it appears, and where it doesn't appear. Uh, and, and that realization has been very slow to come. Uh, we at the UN water level pushed quite hard to bring this notion of uh, uh, water, uh, climate change is all about water in the, in the uh, 2009 debates in Copenhagen. And we had limited traction. Last year, when uh, the climate change uh, conference took place in Cancun, there was a somewhat larger uptake that, yes, water is an issue that uh, the climate change community and the global policymakers should pay attention to. But we're still not quite there yet. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a trend which is building. My own prediction is that uh, in a couple of years' time, we'll see that uh, uh, the global debate will focus much more on water and even more so than climate change or, for that matter, any other globally integrated issue. You know, earlier in your, in, your, in, your, in your remarks, you mentioned that, in fact, uh, uh, policymakers somehow don't get it when it comes to water. So I, I think it's an interesting point. So, so is it because the problem is very, very complex? Is it because it's very difficult to connect the dots? Or is it because that the people who are in charge are not really uh, trained properly? Well, I, I think there's two dimensions to, to the problem. One is that, uh, yes, connecting the dots are a little bit difficult because water sort of pervades every aspect of economic activity and every a aspect of societal uh, operation, so to speak. Uh, so anything from food production to industrial activity to, uh, in many cases, transport of uh, goods and services are tied to, uh, to, to water. And... Uh, Typically what happens in governments is that all of these aspects are dealt with in different ministries. So Ministry of uh, uh, Agriculture will deal with just agriculture but not really look at industrial activity. Uh, ministries of Economy, which where some of this integration should be taking place, simply do not have the, uh, the wherewithal and the, the know-how about how all of these aspects are interconnected. So the connecting the dots is, is one problem. The other problem is that with the so-called, I call it, water community itself, mm -hmm. uh, and I include myself to be part of that. The water community has not done a very good job of uh, providing rational, policy-relevant, and economically uh, logical arguments. So we have uh, made a lot of emotional arguments. So mm -hmm. we'll say, water is life, life is water. Life mm -hmm. doesn't exist without water. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. But what is the consequence for that uh, in terms of a government trying to invest in, say, agricultural production and irrigation systems? Uh, how does it manage uh, groundwater resources? We have not done a very good job of, uh, of uh, putting forward those economic arguments. Now, I, I think, again, there's a bit of a sea change taking place as we speak. Some of this is taking place in the context of preparations for Rio Plus 20 uh, Summit, which will take place next year, about a year from now, uh, where the, the global thinkers and policymakers are saying, we need to look at green economy and how, how does uh, uh, it relate to uh, environmental sustainability, etc. And that's an entry point for water to come in. And it will come in not because... Uh, water is life and, uh, you know, life is water type of argument, but because how water relates to food security and how it relates to energy security. And there are significant dialogues going on now. Um, UN Water as a group is very closely engaged uh, with an effort being undertaken by uh, the German government uh, to uh, create a, uh, a global dialogue on the water-food-energy nexus. And there's a conference being planned in Bonn uh, in November this year that will serve as uh, a preparatory or a, a preemptory uh, dialogue that will then fit into the the real uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. so, we, so there we, is some thinking coming yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. No, so Adil, so the shortcomings that you're highlighting, so 
uh, I, I, I would assume that they are more uh, at work in developing countries than they are in developed countries, but maybe it's not true. And also, I guess that they are probably quite a bit at work at the global level for lack of uh, uh, proper coordination, for lack of proper policies at the global level. Am I right? Or? Well, yes, the, the problems are particularly um, uh, severe in, in uh, developing countries because uh, they have generally weak institutions, uh, and I'm overgeneralizing maybe a bit, yeah. uh, uh, and they are exacerbated by uh, the, the water resource problems, either availability or quality of what's available. But the problems are not just in uh, developing countries. Developed countries also face, uh, face this fragmentation and uh, uh, planning sometimes not taking properly into account uh, the the kind of impacts that, that there would be on, on water. And I give you the example of uh, Canada. Uh, last year, I was part of a group that released a report on the uh, sort of a sector-by-sector -sector analysis of, uh, of uh, uh, water issues and how they are seen by the by the sectors themselves and what impacts they project, for example, as a result of climate change. The energy sector in Canada, and uh, that relates both the the hydropower sector and the, the more traditional oil, petroleum, and gas sector, both of those sectors came back with responses that they did not see water as a major issue, which is quite surprising because uh, hydropower is very much dependent on availability yeah. of water. <laughs> and by the same token, you would see that uh, in uh, in the more traditional petrol-based energy sector also, water ties in, in uh, quite closely. So, um, you know, th this is c kind of interesting that the this uh, these disconnects exist in developed countries as well. Mm -hmm. And again, some countries are a bit more progressive in addressing them than others. So I gave the example of, of the German government. We also see uh, that the French government is also uh, paying a lot of close attention. Uh, last year, uh, almost a year ago from now, as uh, the, the French uh, government started preparing for the World Water Forum that takes place uh, in Marseille next year, uh, President Sarkozy uh, made some very strong statements that the French policy and, and uh, development agenda will focus uh, quite centrally on water. So, so there are some signs that you know the tide is turning, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, but developed countries are not immune from from these problems. So, so that's the picture for developing countries and for developed countries. What about the picture for the global level? I mean, uh, if you had, uh, I mean, two things. Could you first of all describe for us, you know, what are the mechanisms, uh, you know, normative mechanism? institutional mechanisms, operational mechanisms, uh, in the context of which, you know, or through which we are tackling water issues. So, first of all, description, and second of all, assessment. Do you think that it is good enough? Okay. Well, yeah, I can start with the last, but it, it probably isn't good enough. That's why we're, we're having these problems, and mm -hmm. these problems have been quite persistent over the last 20 or 30 years. We've known about them, and they haven't gone away. Um, so let me first talk about the institutional frameworks, and I'll, uh, I'll come to maybe the more normative mm -hmm. ones. Um, the, there is, uh, by and large, a, a gap at the global level in institutional arrangements. So uh, if you look, for example, at the UN system as a whole, there's not a single entity which is responsible for addressing water issues. Uh, when we look at UN Water as an example, uh, which was formed in 2003 to reduce this fragmentation, uh, there are 28 UN organizations which are its members. And these are all agencies and organizations uh, which uh, claim to have something to do with water. And that number by itself tells you that there is actually quite a lot of fragmentation. Uh, and that, in part, is the justification for having a UN water in the first place. Uh, there is, uh, you know, some movement and, and some quarters, uh, some member states, for example, have uh, pushed the notion of developing a new UN water uh, organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so a water organization at the global level that deals with all these issues and it actually serves to integrate uh, the, the, the global agenda. That, in my opinion, is going to be very difficult just because of the prevailing trend that, that exists. Uh, 
And unless there are substantial changes in thinking, particularly on part of the developed countries uh, about the UN and about creating new organizations, that is unlikely to bring about uh, uh, you know, a, a yet another organization. So uh, in the institutional side, I think there, there's uh, significant uh, gaps. Again, we see some uh, uh, regional uh, responses which are a little bit better. So for example, in Europe, you see the European Union has a water framework which talks about how water is man managed within the European Union. And it also sets uh, the agenda for how the European Union invests in uh, development uh, uh, in other parts of the world. So again, there's a little bit more prog progressive thinking at play there. Mm -hmm. In terms of the normative thinking around water, I, I think this is uh, where there are two uh, sort of distinct uh, you know, schools of thought which of late have been uh, converging a little bit better. Uh, one is uh, looking at water as a human right and uh, saying that water is a public good, it, it uh, cannot be traded, and everyone should have access to, uh, to, um, to water as a, as a very basic human right. The, in some ways, the culmination of this argument was last year when uh, uh, around June of last year, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution uh, which actually declares water as a human right. Mm -hmm. Later in the year, the the UN uh, uh, the, the the Commission for Human Rights also passed a similar resolution declaring water as a human right. But, but so, uh, again, uh, Adil, Adil, in concrete terms, what does it mean? Uh, uh, water is a human right. In concrete terms, what are the what are the consequences for such a statement? Yes. Well, first, let me maybe. Uh, in layman terms, describe what the what the water as a human right means. It yeah. means that uh, all humans have the right to have access to adequate amount and uh, uh, quality of water, and it implies underneath that the that the governments are responsible for provisioning of this right to all all its peoples. Um, and there is also not in the uh, in the resolution itself, but there are. Uh, even some metrics defined for saying it should be between 50 and 100 liters per day per person is the is the basic human right. Mm -hmm. And again, there's there's some debates which are triggered around that. Uh, what it means, I think, is is still a little bit early to say what it will, uh, uh, what benefits it will lead to. Uh, you can think of uh, certain streams, so you can think about uh, the ability for people to, for example take legal actions against their governments where they think that their right is being violated or, or not being adequately looked after. Uh, it also means that governments then should pay attention to investing the adequate resources and uh, finances to, to address the, these basic needs. Um, it also means that uh, international investments now should be driven by addressing this uh, um, water as a human right. What will happen in reality, and this is just my own opinion, I think is not going to be as stark as, uh, as a drastic change as a result of the resolution, because the resolution itself is not enforceable. Mm -hmm. So it creates, again, a, a, uh, you know, a, a normative uh, situation or framework in which uh, governments can operate and in, in which societies can perceive what their rights are. And some have even argued that initially in the UN Declaration for Human Rights, this is already enshrined in there. So it isn't something new which has just been granted by the General Assembly, but it had always existed. It just sort of brings it to the top and, and makes it a little bit more prominent. Uh, so there is this uh, one uh, sort of realm of thinking around water as a human right. There's also a second uh, uh, normative framework which talks about uh, water not as an economic commodity, but, uh, uh, you know, water as a, as an, uh, dealing with water as an economic opportunity and uh, talks about, uh, uh, you know, uh, generation of new uh, economic activities which revolve around water, which also in term imply that uh, you will need to have uh, some kind of economic framework in which this exists. And, and there's a lot of uh, controversy around uh, pricing of water, around trading of water, shipping of water from one place to the other, uh, and all of these in, uh, generate 
intense, very emotional debates uh, on, uh, you know, water is our right and we should not uh, give it up and we should not sell it. And and again, the reality is somewhere in between uh, because while water is a human right, somebody is investing to treat that water and to supply it to you. Mm -hmm. And that costs something and somebody has to pay that. So it's either the taxpayers who pay this or these are uh, generated from tariffs from the users and consumers themselves or there are uh, transfers from outside. So meaning Mm -hmm. that overseas aid coming in. There's no other mechanism to pay for this. So there is this tension uh, when it comes to water between water as a, as a public good, as you mentioned, and water as a commodity, also as a mention. And I guess that you are telling us that uh, the, the way to go, the only way to go is probably to find a balance between the two, uh, right? Yes, and, and, and that balance is actually, um, I'm, I'm sure it will arrive, uh, but it's actually there, there are some difficulties in getting there. Some of these are perceptional uh, in, in uh, uh, a lot of people seeing that, you know, when there's talk about pricing of water, that it's an immediate commoditization of water and that it means big biz- businesses will come in and take over this whole water business and, and uh, you'll be paying very high costs for, for water, etc. cetera. Um, and on the other side, uh, uh, there, there are, uh, uh, you know, some thinking that, you know, water is is really something that should be available for free, and it should be really a, a public good, just like air, and and you should just be able to get it. And again, that doesn't take into account the reality. As I said, there is about uh, you know 40 percent of the world surface area, uh, land surface area, which is water scarce. There's not enough water in those areas to have. So it's not just a question of putting in a well or turning on a tap or putting in a pipeline. But you actually have to have the water. In your view, who has the best track record in terms of country, maybe, uh, regarding uh, best practices in terms of finding this uh, magic balance between uh, public good and community? I mean, uh, who has done well in this area? Oh, that's a very <laughs> loaded question. Uh, yes. Because, uh, you know, there. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to point to, uh, to, 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 to single countries uh, yes. because, again, there's a there's a, a mixed bag in, uh, in in there might be some local uh, areas, some provinces where water management is done very well, mm-hmm. but I, I would have difficulty to point to a single country where uh, you know water management is dealt very progressively and whether all where all these uh, aspects are are taken care of. I think when we look at some of the positive examples, I, I think uh, uh, Europe might be an area where, where you would see that uh, uh, in terms of management of their water courses, many of the rivers run through multiple uh, countries, that they've done uh, you know reasonably well in maintaining the quality and uh, uh, improving on the, the impacts from industrial activity on those, uh, on those water bodies, et cetera. So there has been significant uh, uh, sort of regional response. Uh, I think Danube is often uh, cited as an example of how uh, water management across borders can be done right when uh, countries and societies put their mind to it. Uh, On the policy level or uh, water sharing in in basins, uh, also we often give the example of the uh, Indus Water Treaty, which is between India and Pakistan, and which was mediated uh, by the World Bank in the late 50s. Uh, This is again as a water sharing mechanism uh, has uh, stood the test of time and India and Pakistan which have gone through three declared wars uh, have maintained this treaty regardless of the wars that were taking place at the time which uh, in some cases involve India making a paying to Pakistan for use of uh, water resources. Now again with the current climate change and increased stress, that treaty itself is putting, uh, being put under a lot of stress. Uh, but again, I, I see that that's a good example how water can be, can override major conflicts uh, and uh, uh, can lead to uh, perhaps reconciliation at, at certain policy levels. So I think perhaps as a way to, to end our conversation, because I know that you have to go soon, uh, you know, looking for the future a little bit, you know, uh, Rio Plus 20 is going to take place in a, in a year, uh, 
uh, and I know that you're going to be working towards uh, Oyo plus Tanti in the context of, of water issues. I mean, wh what would you what would you want to see happening uh, at Rio Plus 20 uh, as a way to, to, to push forward the, the, water, uh, the water debate, the water issue? Yeah, well, again, a very interesting and somewhat loaded question. Uh, uh, we are, generally speaking, in the water community and uh, more specifically in UN Water, we are targeting our attention on, on this very question uh, as we speak. And we hope that there will be at least three or four key messages that we take to uh, to Rio Plus 20, and they get taken up in the both in the uh, outcomes related to green economy that will come out, and also the uh, sustainable development frameworks, which is the other major focus of the Rio discussions. That there are actually some frameworks which uh, are put in place to implement some of these uh, these water challenges. Now. To, to go back to your question, what are the key things that we would like to see? Uh, we would like to see that there is, at, at the very global level, there is a recognition uh, of the or recognition of the uh, connection between water, food, and energy. And that means that uh, when we are looking at uh, food security policies and uh, food pricing, uh, etc., that is not done in isolation of uh, water. Uh, so the cost of water uh, should be embedded in the uh, uh, in the agricultural production equation. Um, you know there are some specific examples. For example, to start putting the uh, labels of uh, water footprints on on all consumer products. So mm -hmm. when you buy uh, you know a, a cup of coffee, you already know that. While it's just a cup of coffee, it's taken about 15 liters of water to produce that cup yeah. because coffee was harvested and produced and shipped, etc. So, so that kind of realization that uh, that there are significant food uh, water uh, connections, if that comes out as a very clear policy statement, mm -hmm. uh, that that would be a, a significant achievement. I can say the same thing about uh, uh, the energy sector and. Uh, in many parts of the world, uh, hydropower is a very significant component. Uh, so that's one dimension of it. But we also need to look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the emerging issue of biofuels. You have to look at the water costs, which are embedded in uh, even uh, production of uh, the more traditional petrol-based uh, energy resources. Uh, so again, that that should be. Uh, we hope that that can be a significant uh, outcome. Thirdly, what we what I alluded to earlier in the climate change debate, we already see that there is an emergence of uh, understanding and realization that uh, climate change is all about water, and that adaptation to these changes which are coming should figure much more centrally. So the kind of commitments that were made in uh, uh, in Copenhagen two years ago in Tens of billions of dollars by the by the governments to say we want to invest in addressing climate change issues. It would be very useful to say a significant slice of those investments should be dedicated for adaptation uh, of water systems to the climate change uh, impacts that we uh, already know will happen. Some of them are happening already today. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, in, in essence, you know, in the context of Rio Plus 20, you would want to be able to put forward a, a simple, clear, and compelling message as a way to try to have the case being made uh, in support of water issues, right? Right, and and some of that has to come in the form of economic arguments. Yeah, you know, and you can talk about the price of action and the price of inaction. Mm -hmm. And and some of those figures are already out there, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, particularly when you put it in human terms, uh, and the kind of uh, you know death rate that that is associated with these problems, I, I think they really very strongly underline uh, you know the the need for uh, these kind of economic investments. So it's it's partly about telling uh, telling you know in, in in the right terms, telling a good story. Yeah, and and as I said before. The water community has not done it correctly. This is just my opinion, being a member of that community. And I think we're now uh, hopefully getting it right. <laughs>
So we, we're now uh, bringing our act together in a way that the argument uh, goes forward and is actually accepted.